Welcome to another edition of the Litigation Psychology Podcast, <clears throat> brought to you by Courtroom Sciences. I am Dr. Bill Kanaski. Solo edition today. How's everybody doing? We're in the Carolina Blue football jersey, football back in session. I'm going to start my rant out with, actually, this is a positive rant, but I'm going to start with a complaint. Uh, these, um, these college football players faking injuries. It's got to stop. Well, this year it's going to stop. NCAA has come out with new rules to prevent the faking of injuries. These are usually on defense to slow the high-powered offense down. It's got to stop. Your team's on a great drive, right? And then all of a sudden, that cramp just happens to pop up. It's always in the third and fourth quarter, particularly the fourth quarter. NCAA putting the kibosh on that, thankfully. Don't be faking injuries, folks. I know it's with, it was within the rules for a long time, but not a good way to play it. Substitute your players in the way you're supposed to, okay? No need for this. Uh, today's podcast topic is very interesting. This topic today I'm going to talk to you about is a little controversial. Some of you are going to get a little perturbed, but that's nothing unusual, right? It's part of what I do. If I'm not ticking somebody off, then I'm doing something wrong. Um, today, I'm going to talk to you about uh, over 19 years of doing this job as a witness prep expert, jury psychologist. Um, I've, I've worked on, a, on quite a few plaintiff cases, and I've worked with plaintiff attorneys. And today's podcast is really about sharing with you what I've learned from plaintiff attorneys and working with them. Now, before everybody starts going nuts... He's like, oh my God, you work with the plaintiff side. Oh my God, you're, you're supposed to be all defense. But everybody just settle down. The vast majority of my work on the plaintiff side is with commercial litigation, where the plaintiff is a corporation who is typically a traditional defendant. Okay, so let's, let's get that point across. This is not personal injury, stuff like that, right? However, I'm going to confess something because now the case is well over and I'm going to confess something. An unnamed attorney who's a very good friend of mine in the Southeast United States, he's a 40-year defense trial attorney. And he called me one day and he said, listen, a a friend of the family I was in a car accident. Um, they really, really want me to handle the case. And I don't do plaintiff work. I'm a defense attorney. Can you help me? And that is a, is a auto accident case. And the defenses, uh, the defense um, uh, wanted to settle the case for $200,000. Uh, the plaintiff in this case wanted $1 million. So they were miles apart. And this case goes to trial. Short trial. I took, I think, maybe four days. And my buddy calls me defense counsel and he says, can you help me? Because I can't think like a plaintiff attorney. And so what I did was, uh, well, I did a few things. Um, number one, I helped uh, him design the appropriate uh, voir dire questions and uh, jury questionnaire questions to identify pro-defense jurors. That was number one, uh, which is the you know mirror. It's the polar opposite of doing that on the defense side. Uh, but I've done this before for plaintiff cases, so um, I knew what I was doing there. Number two, to develop an opening statement that would be the most highly effective. And so I took his opening statement, his outline, and I reordered the entire thing. Because ordering of information, if you've read my paper on the primacy and recency effects, ordering of information is key to persuasion. And what you put up front is the most important stuff. Okay. And he had it out of whack. He had it out of order. So I fixed the order. Uh, third, order of witnesses. Okay. Order of witnesses. Again, on the defense side, you know, much of the time you assume your people are going to be called as adverse witnesses, right? Um, we wanted to shake things up, so we shook some things up, but I knew exactly what order um, of witnesses was going to be most persuasive uh, to this jury. And so I took his order. I pretty much reversed it because, <laughs> uh, again, he was thinking defense mind. And um, I won't tell you who the 
witnesses were obviously, but I, I reordered uh, the witnesses for the for the plaintiff's case. And uh, this case goes to trial. And then he calls me uh, right after the verdict. And the jury comes back with a one million dollar uh, award. So plaintiff win and they got exactly what they were asking for. And we talked about anchoring. Right. And we bet that the defense would not counter anchor. We were 100 percent correct. They never, never even brought up a number and um, talked a lot about how to, how to handle the damages discussion in jury selection, opening statement, closings and um, kind of a slam dunk case. Um, but again, that's very, very rare. I did that to help, you know, to help a, a, a current, a long time defense attorney out because he was helping the, uh, a family friend. Um, but I've worked on a lot of other plaintiff's cases, again, mostly commercial litigation. And, and these are plaintiff attorneys. Uh, they're not personal injury plaintiff attorneys, though, uh, but they are plaintiff attorneys. And I want to share with you some things that I've learned in my experiences with them. And this is not bashing defense counsel. I'm just saying uh, you all are wired very, very differently. And I wrote down a list. I wanted, I wanted to run this by you because I think that the defense bar, the defense attorneys can learn a lot from this. And things do need to change because the plaintiff's bar has evolved. They've evolved greatly and they continue to evolve. And one would argue that the defense bar has been slow to evolve. So let's go over this list of things I have learned in 19 years of you know, doing a really good handful of uh, plaintiff's cases uh, year after year. Number one, their desire to win, their internal flame, <laughs> the burning desire to win is off the charts. It's unmatched. These folks um, really, really badly want to win for their clients. And um, I got to tell you, it's impressive. And when you work with people like that, boy, it makes life a lot easier. Um, now, granted, plaintiff attorneys are getting paid differently, so there are some motivational differences there. But um, one thing across all these cases is that these folks had a deep, deep desire to win and um, fight really, really hard um, for their client. And um, it's a type of energy. I'm not saying defense counsel doesn't have desire to win. I'm just saying these folks, it's, 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 it's higher. It is. I'm sorry. It is in most cases, not all cases, but across the board, you know, looking at the averages, um, this desire is through the roof. Um, and I found that to be impressive. I found that to be impressive. And we're not talking, you know, manipulating anyone or using dirty tricks or reptile stuff or stuff like that. I'm just talking about an inherent desire to win, almost like a Michael Jordan type of desire um, to win. See, I, I always have to throw a Tar Heel <laughs> into the equation. Um, but, you know, my, the, the, Michael Jordan's level of competitiveness, if you talk to anybody that played with him or against him, was just unmatched. And that's the type of determination I see from, um, from plaintiff's counsel. And I think that's important to mention. Um, hats off to these folks that I've worked with. I continue to work with in commercial litigation. Um, number two is... Um, they have a very different view on jury decision-making research. Uh, in other words, uh, using focus groups and mock trials. Um, they, they not only want to do them, they want, which is what I, I always recommend to my clients, and particularly the higher exposure cases that make sense, is to do jury research so you know what you're dealing with, right? Um, not only they want to do that, but they use a methodology that I am very fond of, uh, and I try to persuade my defense clients to use it. And oftentimes they do, sometimes they don't because it, it is more expensive. But um, what the plaintiff's attorneys I've worked with, um, they love what I call the test retest methodology. The test retest methodology. They want to do it twice, sometimes even a third time to make tweaks to their case to improve their odds of success and liability causation damages and what you have to do is do serial projects learn from the preceding projects make the adjustments apply it to the next project 
And, you know, for example, on project one, you know, uh, say mock trial, uh, perhaps, um, you know, liability split 50, 50. Well, you want to get that number up to say 75 or 80 or above. Well, the way to do that is to assess your arguments from the first mock trial, take what the juror's feedback was from that, change, make your tweaks, make your tweaks, and then do it again and see, is that number going up or down? Are you stuck on 50-50? Did you get to 65? Did it explode up to 90? Or did it go down, right? So serial projects to increase the chances that they're going to win a trial by constantly and consistently improving their arguments, improving their themes, improving their exhibits. Okay. Tweaking things along the way and see how mock jurors are reacting um, on all of these cases, wild success, wild, wild success with that methodology. Again, I do have defense clients that, do precisely that. And they've had wild success. <clears throat> but I'm saying the frequency in which uh, the plaintiff attorneys that I've worked with um, is much, much higher in that regard. So serial projects will get you more accurate, more reliable uh, results on what's going to happen uh, in, in, the, in the real courtroom. <clears throat> Number three, similar uh, point uh, related, is they want to do the jury research as soon as humanly possible. Now, defense, defense clients often say, well, I want to let so much discovery happen before I do a, why? You know what happened. You know the key players, okay? You don't need a lot of a discovery to start testing your case. And what I've noticed is that the plaintiff attorneys want to do, and I know that the personal injury plaintiff attorneys for sure do this, is they want to focus group matters, okay, well before discovery is over for a couple of reasons. Number one, they want, to, they, want the they want the feedback on the basics. They want to know how do jurors feel about the story about the about facts about evidence they really really are interested in that and the sooner they get that information the 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 better they're set up number two the reason why they want this early is they want it to guide discovery i think this is a, a critical point that a lot of people don't understand you can take your jury research to guide your subsequent witness prep right if you know jury, how jurors feel about the key aspects of your case, you can use that to guide uh, your witnesses with their theme development, the case theme development overall, what you're looking for from your, from your experts, okay? Meaning you can use that information. It's golden to have a deep impact on discovery versus you, you go through discovery and then you test everything you have and then you find out it's shit and discovery is closed. Well, that's no good. So this myth that you have to wait till discovery is a certain amount of a way, the way done or even complete before you start testing your case is complete bullshit. Complete bullshit. Um, the sooner the better. The sooner the better. And again, you can, you can focus group key aspects of your case very, very early and get vital vital golden juror feedback on what they think about the basics. And that can really, really help you in discovery. <clears throat> and that's what these plan fraternities have done. And on the cases I have worked with uh, them on, they have done. <clears throat> and again, it, it's a game changer and they're better. I gonna again, I'm just, don't shoot the messenger folks. <clears throat> the plan of attorneys I work with are betting. They're, they're betting the farm that the defense is not doing the same thing. And in most cases they're right. So again, we always talk about, you know, our, our methodologies, our philosophies towards the defense bar is to, hey, get moving early. Early is better. You know, early information is power. Early knowledge is power. <clears throat> Plan bar is miles ahead on that. <clears throat> but I do um, encourage uh, the defense bar to get started early. That's what your adversary is doing. That's what your adversary is doing. All right. So that's number three. Uh, number four, and the final point, we'll make this a shorter podcast. <clears throat> um, they, 
Number four is interesting. The number four thing I want to share with you about my experience with working with plaintiff attorneys, they deeply desire my consulting feedback in an effort to become better attorneys. They want me to highly criticize their opening statement on paper. Then they want me to watch them give it. Then they want me to rip them a new one on where they're screwing up. They have a deep desire to become better attorneys and they want to nail it. And while they're doing that, my ability to give them that type of feedback and then to have them use it is absolutely, is absolutely critical um, to attorney growth and to um, cutting out a lot of the things that are unnecessary that they're doing that maybe their brain thinks it's important, but I know from the jury psychology aspect of it, it's not important or it's misguided. It's misdirected. Um, this also comes, you know, opening statements, how they're doing uh, voir dire and jury selection, right? How are they doing that? How are they coming across? What are, where are they answer? Are they asking questions then? Okay. Uh, they deeply desire this advice and guidance to become better with their skill set. And I find that fascinating. I have had some, in fact, had a defense attorney, a uh, really, really good guy in California, sent an email to Dr. Uh, Wood and I recently saying, hey, we just did a mock trial with you guys. Can you guys go, can you give me some feedback? Can you go back and look at the videotape of my opening in the mock, you know, in the mock trial? <laughs> can you give me some guidance on how to be, I want to be a better attorney. This is from a defense attorney. Okay. That call comes two times a year from a defense attorney on the plaintiff cases that I work on. It's, it's constant. It is constant. Every exhibit, every demonstrative run it, run it by Kanaski. Okay. When do I bring this up? How do I bring this up? Is my color scheme, right? Is, am I overwhelmed? You're an expert in jury psychology. Or am I cognitively overwhelming the jury with this timeline? Right. Don't get as much of that from, defense attorneys. Now, is it a locus of control thing? Could be. Um, I think, um, I, I think, again, I just think the two types of attorneys are wired very, um, wired very differently, but I do like working with attorneys to help them become better attorneys. Had another, uh, in fact, this morning, had a, uh, I gave a speech on Friday on amygdala hijack <clears throat> And one of the audience members uh, called me this morning and said, I want, yeah, I, I'm in a firm. We have 25 attorneys. And this guy's been trying cases for 40 years, he told me. And he goes, I want to keep getting better. And I want everybody below me to get better. I want to bring you in. And I, I want the cutting edge training. I want everything you know about jury psychology as of today. I want every, every reptile update. I want you to show our younger attorneys the best way to do voir dire. I want you to go through the neuroscience behind the opening statements and why primacy and recency are very, very different, both important, but very different. How do my attorneys order information to persuade jurors more effectively? Where are the, where are the landmines? Where are the pitfalls? Okay, where, where are my attorneys screwing up? They think they're doing the right thing, but in reality, maybe they're not. Okay, I want my attorney, I'll, I'll grab a couple of volunteers to deliver an opening to you. Will you critique them? That's from a defense attorney. That was a really, really important phone call today. That more of that has got to happen. And uh, speaking, today's been a busy freaking day, folks. <laughs> then I had a corporate client call me from a Fortune 500 company. They've been my client for five years. I love them. <clears throat> great people, great company. And they said, we're having a problem with our panel counsel because a lot of them are older. They're set in their ways. And we got plaintiff attorneys evolving. <laughs> they're not evolving. They're doing the same stuff they did 10, 15, 20 years ago. <clears throat> And, and we're suffering in the courtroom. One, we, we, we need to do two things. A, get more, they need to be open-minded to training, but B, get those younger people involved. That's a big challenge for the defense bar right now. Everybody's scared shitless over this. I, me personally, I'm wearing a diaper right now. 
That's how terrified I am. Because I, in the next seven to 10 years, you're going to have a group of 30 and 40 something defense counsel getting up to the big leagues. And they're not going to have as much trial experiences as the same aged plaintiff's counsel. Absolutely terrifying what could uh, happen here because the plaintiff's bar is very smart. They pay and invest money, time, energy into training. They try more cases. They mock trial and focus group 10 times more than they're always in front of a jury somehow. Could be a mock jury, could be a real jury. That is a big, big deal. Particularly for defense counsel, you're trying one to three cases a year, right? And then you got your adversaries trying maybe double the amount of cases, plus they're doing all this mock. So they're, they're always arguing in front of a jury and getting feedback. That adds up, folks. That adds up. And then you do that year after year after year, exponentially multiplies. Now, can the defense stop this? Yeah, if they get their head out of their ass. Yeah, they can. They can. Can they invest in training for veteran attorneys to get even better? Yeah, they can. For their younger attorneys to, to fast track their skill set? Uh, yeah, they can. But they're not at the frequency that we'd like to see. So um, I'll wrap it up there. I don't want to make this long, but I just been thinking about this because right now I'm working on a plaintiff case. It's commercial litigation. <clears throat> and um, I got to tell you, it's a very different experience for me. Um, I enjoy it. And we're doing all these things that I just talked about. And um, I, th I, I was thinking today, wow, you know, there's a, really, there's a real difference between working on a case like this and some of these other cases. And I wanted to point out those differences. And I would challenge defense attorneys, challenge defense attorneys, regardless of how great you think you are, right? Or how established you are, you can always learn something new. You can always learn something new, even if it's just one little thing. And by the way, the world's changing. Jurors are changing. A lot's changing. And as the plaintiff bar evolves, I am fortunate. I work on over two, 200 cases in a year. I see every trick, every trick. I see everything that they're doing well before you will. <laughs> so uh, kind of like your cell phone, right? You get that software upgrade every couple of months. I've got an upgrade every couple of months. I try to bring it to you folks here on the podcast, but if you need anything, call me, email me, set up a time, even if it's just 15 or 20 minutes, you have a question, you have a concern, hey, what are the last updates? What are you seeing? Okay, what's working? What's not working, Bill? I love getting those phone calls. I got a couple of them today. And so um, I hope you enjoy this version of the Litigation Psychology Podcast. Um, and to everybody out there, we appreciate uh, the listenership is exploding. It's just fantastic. Um, a lot of I just massive amounts of positive uh, feedback. Our new paper on cognitive distortions. We did three episodes on cog the 13 cognitive distortions. They're screwing up your witnesses brain, which subsequently screws up their testimony. <laughs> uh, that's done. So now we're going to figure out where to publish that. So on the cutting edge um, is, is where we want to be. And we want to get that information to our listeners. So keep listening. Please refer this podcast to a friend or maybe circulate the link uh, uh, across the firm. And again, if you need something, hey, B. Kanaski at courtroomsciences.com, set up a time. Happy to talk with you free of charge. May make you buy me a cup of coffee at some point. Um, but other than that, uh, I am here to help. So again, thank you for participating in this edition of the Litigation Psychology Podcast. I am Dr. Bill Kanaski. We'll see you next time.